It is 3.17 p.m. Louisiana State Police arrive at the farm of Cleveland Lenore, east of Delhi, after word of a suspected tornado. They see mangled cars, debarked trees, and bits of housing scattered for hundreds of yards. Priority quickly shifts when they find a boy seriously injured along the bank of an adjacent bayou. His other family members are nowhere to be found. Sunday, February 21st, 1971. For days now, the southeast has been unseasonably warm for late winter. Responsible for this is an extreme weather pattern overhead. Two closed upper lows over the western U.S. are tied to a massive trough. They would swing around each other and combine, pushing the trough into a negative tilt. This makes for stronger instability, stronger wind shear, and more moisture advection. All key ingredients for a severe weather outbreak. Already on the case, the National Severe Storms Forecast Center issues tornado watch bulletins across the coverage areas of Shreveport, Jackson, and Memphis. The Jackson office, headed by meteorologist in charge Donald Monroe, calls for an extra meteorologist to handle the extra workload and one more to have a second set of eyes on the radar scope. To add to their lines of defense, Mississippi Highway Patrol headquarters is alerted to the upcoming weather. The patrolmen are trained every year in storm spotting and have developed a strong working relationship with the Jackson WSO. Their training would be put to the test in the coming hours. 75 miles west of Jackson, the weather over Richland Parish was rapidly deteriorating. Three miles south of downtown Delhi, Louisiana, the first major tornado of the day reaches the ground. Quickly intensifying, it follows a northeast track over farm fields and pockets of trees before overtaking US Route 80. Shortly thereafter, the Lenore residence is impacted. Inside are Ella Lenore with her eight children and two grandchildren. 10 of the 11 would not survive. Their remains are scattered between a bayou and a farm field. At the WSO in Shreveport, the radar operator observes a strong hook echo to the east of Delhi. They immediately issue a tornado warning for Madison Parish. In the 12 minutes elapsed from touchdown, the tornado has already been on the ground for 10 and a half miles. Seeing the same storm on their radar, the Jackson WSO issues a tornado warning for the four Mississippi counties ahead of the Delhi storm. The tornado crosses the Mississippi River south of Transylvania, Louisiana. At 3.55, Mississippi Highway Patrol radioed that the tornado was still on the ground approximately four miles west of Rolling Fork, missing the city center. Along Mississippi State Route 14, a mobile home would be thrown and shredded, killing its residents with lines of trees getting debarked. South of Nidiyuma along US 61 was Kometa Plantation, where every structure would not only be flattened, but also granulated. Three people lost their lives at the plantation. After avoiding town centers for the first 60 miles of its life, the small community of Delta City was now squarely in the path of the beastly multi-vortex tornado. Simultaneously 25 miles to the south, another large tornado plants to the southwest of Cary. Like the northern tornado, it too takes aim at a plantation, meeting an identical fate as most of the debris of the structures ends up in a bayou to the north. Across US 61 was the Sun Oil Company, Belgrade Lumber Yard, and accompanying neighborhood where many of the employees lived. In a matter of seconds, all would be obliterated as stacks of timber add to the lethal debris cloud and fertilizer tanks rupture, releasing a deadly fog of ammonia. The tornado leaves Cary to the northeast, where between the Havana Plantation and Cary, 13 lives were claimed. The highway patrol radio in the confirmation of this second large tornado when it is due east of Rolling Fork. It just missed a direct hit for the second time in nearly an hour. Back with the northern tornado, Delta City would be hit head on. Much like the earlier impacted areas, little would remain of the small town as a school, church, funeral home, and numerous shops were windrowed and granulated into the adjacent fields. While many had heaved the 50-minute advanced warning to find better shelter, others did not, resulting in another eight people lost to the tornado. The storm advanced through mostly farm fields past Delta City before reaching the Mound Lake Plantation. Like the other plantations hit, the weak structures were no match. Driving north on US 49 is 18-year-old Johnny Ammons. 
His parents' car would be peppered with debris from the now obliterated plantation, causing the windows to implode. In those terrifying few seconds, he believed that this was the end. Fortunately, the car stayed planted on the road. Unfortunately, he now witnessed the monster tornado lay waste to his hometown of Inverness. Among the first structures hit is the town's elementary school, with both wings of classrooms getting completely leveled. Surrounding the school were the homes of Inverness's African-American population. Towns like Inverness were only a few years removed from the Jim Crow era, meaning communities were still rather segregated geographically. The poorly constructed homes offered little shelter as those impacted by the core of the tornado were shredded. Further north, much of the industrial businesses were heavily damaged or outright destroyed, which included the Duncan Cotton Gin, a vital processing plant for the local agricultural industry. North of downtown starkly contrasted from the south, as larger, more sturdy structures bore more of the brunt of the tornado. Nonetheless, most still lost their roofs, with some furthermore collapsing. The warning from the Jackson WSO came 25 minutes prior to the storm arriving in Inverness. Sheltering in the weaker structures proved to be futile, as 19 residents would perish in the 90 seconds that the tornado traversed the town. As that tornado continued north, the Cary tornado approached the outskirts of the city of Belzoni. The Jackson WSO had already phoned the police in the city to prepare for the dangerous twister. Five miles southwest of downtown is Gooden Lake, though sparsely populated. The few homes hit would result in another seven fatalities. Downtown would avoid a direct hit by two miles to the west, but the Belzoni outskirt of Castleman was not as fortunate. Multiple side streets of homes are erased, with the little evidence of their prior existence scattered into the adjacent field. Eight miles north-northeast of Belzoni is the small plantation community of Pew City. Once again, the low-income housing proved deadly as homes were disintegrated and windrowed. Adding to the carnage were the large pieces of farming equipment thrown like matchbox cars. Pew City and the adjacent areas would see the greatest amount of loss on this day with a devastating 28 fatalities. Happening concurrently with the destruction of Pew City, the northern tornado set its sights on the populated town of Moorhead. While still large in size, the tornado had finally taken on a weakening trend as it impacted the western side of town. Some houses were still heavily damaged while others were completely moved off of foundations, providing a clue as to how many of the previously impacted houses failed. This storm would claim its last three lives at the Pepper family household, killing parents Thomas and Virginia, alongside their daughter, Mary. It continued several more miles past town, weakening and then finally roping out over 100 miles from its origin near Delhi, Louisiana. The day was far from over though in the Delta. Shortly before five local time, Reports into the Jackson WSO confirmed that the Cary tornado is still ongoing and approaching Morgan City. It missed the main part of town, but the residences, agricultural mills, and churches of the northwestern corner of the community succumbed to the core of the twister. While avoiding the heavily populated city of Greenwood to the northwest, Morgan City was the last community directly hit by this tornado. As the Cary tornado left the delta into the heavily wooded northern central region of the state, the day's trifecta was beginning to take shape further south. Highway Patrol reports a funnel cloud near the town of Edwards at 450. The Jackson WSO confirms yet another hook echo south of Vicksburg, prompting the issuance of tornado warnings upstream at 5 p.m. Maturing to the east of Bovina, the first victims would be claimed as a home was wiped away, leaving only scattered cinder blocks. The bodies of the homeowners are found in an adjacent field, with their son seriously injured. Past Bovina, the tornado entered the dense Pine Hills. This prevented any serious human impacts for the next 20 miles. Astonishingly, the Cary tornado still had some fight in it at this time, causing damage in isolated properties sprinkled throughout the wooded areas of the state with injuries at some of the locations. The conclusion of the Cary tornado took place shortly after 6 p.m. local time some 115 miles from its origin. The third tornado had not quit upon exiting the woods west of Bentonia, where the homes on Mississippi 433 fell victim. 
the tornado's worst impact would be felt north of Bentonia in the small intersection village of Little Yazoo. Plowing straight over the intersection, the Central Baptist Church is the first to be hit where the deacon inside would perish. Following the church, a school, garage, gas station, hardware, and grocery stores were destroyed. Surrounding those structures were numerous homes with varying degrees of damage. Little Yazoo was completely changed in just seconds, with the lives of six taken too soon. The storm continued for the next several miles to the northeast, impacting several more homes and businesses along the way, but would remain mostly over rural woodland. It dissipated three miles southwest of Lexington, concluding its 71-mile path shortly before 6.30 p.m. In the span of just over three hours, three violent tornadoes had combined for a total of 290 miles of complete devastation. 1,600 people were seriously injured, and most tragically, the lives of 121 were lost. Numerous other tornadoes occurred across the region on the 21st of February, resulting in a final confirmed total of 14. However, many more likely occurred, going unnoticed in the densely wooded regions of the state. The robust storm system continued eastward into the Carolinas, where the following day, more tornadoes occurred, resulting in further injuries and an additional two fatalities. The aftermath of the 1971 Delta outbreak was catastrophic. An event with this level of consequence had not been seen since the Palm Sunday outbreak six years prior. For the communities impacted, recoveries varied. Towns like Inverness would bounce back, as much of the local agricultural industry relied heavily on the large cotton gins and other post-processing plants to sell crop yields. On the other side of the spectrum were the small villages like Pew City. Relief efforts were heavily focused elsewhere as lingering economic and racial inequalities plagued the systems in place. Plantation-based communities like Pew City never rebuilt. Today, the only sign of its previous existence are a few abandoned structures as farmland covers the previous streets and homes that once made up the village. The rating process for these tornadoes would occur retroactively, as the Fujita scale was still a few years away from full adoption. The Little Yazoo and Cary tornadoes earned F4 ratings, while Inverness would earn the top tier F5. This rating is controversial, as much of the extreme devastation can be attributed to the annihilation of low-income housing that would have likely not been able to verify F5 intensity wins. Nonetheless, the Inverness F5 made it the first and only tornado to be rated a 5 to strike the state of Louisiana. Only three tornado events in the U.S. since this outbreak have surpassed the loss of life seen on that day. Contributing to the day's horrific events was the lingering effects of division in the Deep South, especially in the farming communities of the Mississippi Delta. Even with that dark reality, the total fatality still could have been significantly greater had it not been for the actions of the Jackson Weather Service Office. Bringing in extra meteorologists to work the event and routinely training the Mississippi Highway Patrol and storm spotting proved to be life-saving. Though it is one of the most significant tornado events of the past 60 years, its acknowledgement has been lost in the shadow casted by the 1974 super outbreak. Lessons of southern vulnerability to violent tornadoes proves to still be an issue in the Delta, as tornadoes like Yazoo City and Rolling Fork in recent years still cause high casualty rates in inadequate shelter locations. Even though it may be overshadowed, the lessons of the 1971 Delta outbreak still need to be learned well over 50 years later.